Well, thank, thank you. you. Yes, yes, my name is Tom Lavin. I'm, my, my practice is based out of New Orleans, and um, I'm going to get into the pose and really kind of vibe your history of coming to where we are today. Uh, as far as disclosures, there they are. We're going to get into a review of the procedure because this is a new endoluminal procedure so that everyone can understand how, uh, how it's done. And then some recent uh, publications as well as uh, um, getting to the essential trial in the U.S. that is now uh, the FDA has all the information there. And then we have some recent uh, European trials. This is basically the setup of the OR. It's a little bit of a confusing slide, but it's done under general anesthesia. You see that the surgeon and the assistant are at the head of the bed, uh, crowding anesthesia. It, um, it is general anesthesia, like I said. It's done under 40 minutes. We typically do the procedure in about 20 minutes, so it has a pretty quick learning curve and uh, pretty uh, predictable, uh, um, quick uh, procedure. You place eight to 10 sutures up in the fundus and the IOP, the device that allows you to get there is very, um, it's fixed and it allows easy access to the fundus to really bring down the entire fundus and you'll see some pictures of that. We also put three to four sutures in the distal body um, at the end of the procedure. So this is the transport coming down and we get in the rec retroflex position, and it fixes in this position. It gives you great access, once again, to the fundus. There are three lumen, one, of course, for the camera, and then one for the grasper, and then one for the um, suturing device. Actually, there's a fourth for, uh, for suction, which uh, we rarely use. This device actually pulls the tissue in while the suturing device will uh, place the, the basket system, as you see right there. There's a second basket, and these, of course, are full thickness bites, and uh, it cuts the tissue, and you create two rows in the fundus to really reduce the size of the fundus. Second, you go to the distal body, and you place approximately four um, applications to decrease the outflow in the distal body. And you can see 5,000 post procedures since 2009. It's a pretty staggering figure. Most of these have been done, obviously, um, uh, outside the U.S. I'm going to run through some uh, trials, and uh, the first one is by uh, Gontran Lopez Nava, and this is a single site uh, um, uh, trial that was published in um, uh, uh, SWORD, and this uh, trial, he actually started with 198 patients, ended up with 116 patients a year with very uh, significant <coughs> weight loss results. You can see the total body weight loss of 16%. No real serious uh, <coughs> um, adverse events, and um, and uh, so really good weight loss results in this uh, study. The second one is Motivate. That was done out of Barcelona, and uh, this this was a totally different trial, a single site, and it was uh, designed to look at both efficacy as well as uh, peptide <coughs> changes post pose and uh, satiety changes. And you can see it's a very small study and that was secondary to the, the cost of uh, peptides and the cost of the study. So it's 18 patients, mean OR time 51 minutes, um, 14 anchors, uh, BMI 36, pretty much standard. So the first, uh, first thing are the actual efficacy and weight loss. These patients lost um, you can see uh, uh, excess weight loss in the 64% in 15 months. Um, they had 15 patients make it to the 15 months. One was lost to pregnancy, and two others were lost to follow up. This is very significant, and we, we've seen this across the board since uh, we've been involved with uh, the, the POSE procedure. 
patients describe this satiety uh, change. And so to study it, the motivate uh, uh, the group and the motivate study had patients drink, um, uh, had liquid meals over about every three minutes, and they had, um, had the patients tell them when they felt full and they couldn't drink anymore. And there was statistically significant uh, change between the pre-pose and then at two months and six months in both time and volume, as you can see here. And that was consistent with what we had felt early on in the pose experience. Second, this was uh, the peptide changes uh, in the study, and they looked at ghrelin and PYY. And interestingly, the ghrelin, you can see there, was higher post-pose, but the delta or decrease after a meal, the slope of that change was significantly different from, from um, the pre-pose. And the same with the PYY. The delta or slope of the increase in PYY from pre-meal to post-meal was much more significant post-pose. So there were obvious peptide changes. The mild post study is uh, a multi-site, randomized, not blinded study uh, in Europe <laughs> that has not been published yet, but it is being evaluated uh, uh, for publication now. So they had 44 patients. It was a three to one randomized trial. Once again, not blinded, so the patients knew whether they actually had the pose or were just in the diet and exercise group, and it was really to evaluate the difference between the active and the diet and exercise group. Uh, the two groups were pretty much uh, the same. Um, once again, three to one randomization, so you had 34 in the treatment group and 10 in the control group. No major intraoperative or perioperative complications. Um, mild throat uh, pain, which we pretty much see uh, throat pain and mild nausea in most of the patients. The, there were two post-op uh, bleeding uh, that resolved within 24 hours without sequelae. And here are the weight, weight loss results uh, over the first 12 months with a strong delta of 7.4 between the uh, exercise and diet arm and the active arm, and 12.6 uh, total body weight loss, which is uh, impressive. So the essential trial is now all the results are with the FDA, and we're just hitting the two-year results on, or two-year uh, outpatients. And this was a two-to-one randomized sham study where you had the active arm with the post procedure and nutritional and exercise counseling, and the sham arm with only nutrition and exercise counseling. Randomization occurred in the operating room, which was pretty um, interesting. We had patients that would come to the OR, they had no idea if they were getting the procedure. They'd be entered in the computer, and the computer would tell us whether they were active or sham arm. And everything uh, was tightly controlled as far as the door was covered. The people that were uh, Unblinded were tightly controlled in this trial. We had 332 patients with 34 lead-ins uh, at 11 sites in the U.S. There, there was class one obesity, so BMI 30 to 35 had to have a comorbid condition, and that uh, resulted in that group actually being smaller than the uh, class two or 35 to 40 BMI, where they did not need a comorbid condition to be in the study. <coughs> Measure lab values, hunger, satiety, and quality of life, and uh, safety analysis between the groups at 12 months, and uh, efficacy endpoints at 12 months. Once again, this is all with the FDA right now. The primary efficacy endpoints were uh, responder rate, which we put at greater than 5% uh, total body weight loss, and uh, statistical superiority test, um, the difference in uh, percent total body weight loss between the active and sham arm. And the design was in a real world setting, as you'll see. So the, the, as a physician, I only saw the patient at a week and in 12 months, but they were followed at a month, three months, six months, nine and 12, every three months by the dietitian and the nurse. Because I was unblinded, they wanted to limit my, uh, uh, all the investigators' contacts with the, the patients. So you see the investigators saw the patients only at a week and then in 12 months with uh, 
with nutritional counseling with dietitian nurse uh, every three months after a month. We had um, the two groups were pretty much uh, identical. One of the interesting things we had a fairly high black population in both the active and sham arm. The BMIs were uh, very matched as well as the comorbid conditions. The procedure is relatively easy and it was completed in all but one of the active uh, cases. It was designed such that when, if you were in the sham arm, you stayed in the room for 45 minutes. That's why the sham arm cases took 44 minutes. And basically all we did, we would do a pre-op and, and, or we would do an endoscopy at, at general anesthesia and then place a bougie and every 15 minutes just turn the bougie and wait in the room and then of course go out and take all the precautions with the family so they didn't know and the operative uh, dictation was under lock and key so no, nobody would know. Number of banker used were, were basically the same. The intervention time uh, of the active arm was actually less because we had to stay in 45 minutes. Uh, so the active arm was 40 minutes. We're actually you know, doing the procedures. It's a pretty quick learning curve. They, they literally take 20 minutes once you, you've done, uh, I'd say, 50 or more. So as far as the AEs, um, there, were, there were six that had greater than 5% in incidence, and there were only three that had statistical significance between the active and the sham arm, and those were pain, nausea, and vomiting, as you would expect. And so those three, but they were, you know, uh, they had quick resolution. Um, basically, you can see with the vomiting uh, at, uh, you know, very, very quick uh, resolution within uh, seven days, um, as well as nausea and pain. So the SAEs were, um, the rate was greater than 5% because vomiting, nausea, or pain requiring readmission was an SAE. And so though, those, um, uh, there were patients that would need uh, to be readmitted. <laughs> the, I find the nausea and vomiting much, much less than other procedures like the balloon. Um, it's just not nearly to that level. The extra gastric bleeding and hepatic abscess are the two that were of significance in the, um, all the active group. The extra gastric bleeding went back on the, the uh, tape and there was a reason for it. Um, when, when the investigator placed the, the device, a needle uh, uh, goes full thickness and you have to place your basket to tampon on it at that point. And he let go and grasped it again and that patient uh, required uh, um, open laparotomy and repair, but uh, she did well. And then the hepatic abscess, um, that, there was one case there that uh, resolved with percutaneous drainage and IV antibiotics out, out of the 255 active group. This, we did 15 <coughs> randomized endoscopies in 12 months, and you can see these full thickness bites are totally intact at 12 months um, without erosions or other ulcerations or problems. That was consistent with all the endoscopies and the, the Post procedures that have been done over the years. The, these are long-term durable anchors. So in conclusion, POSE uh, has a very st strong uh, safety profile and um, uh, th these appear to be durable anchors long-term and weight loss uh, outcomes are good. I'm gonna touch on the our results because uh, they're being presented at DDW in May. Uh, we're not going to strong efficacy uh, data today, although I'd like to, um, but uh, they will be presented in May at DDW as well as IFSO in uh, Sweden. So, but we did, we did see a uh, uh, significant uh, effect, um, uh, clinical effect, uh, a treatment effect of the procedure. And once again, I'd like to go into the efficacy data, but uh, we'll uh, touch on, we'll go into detail at DDW.